Welcome to the NWAETC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Unruh and I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Brian Wood, our medical director, to introduce our guest. Thanks, Kent. Well, I'd like to welcome Dr. Eric Strakan to ECHO. Dr. Strakan is one of the psychologists here at Madison Clinic and an assistant professor of psychiatry. And he's going to give us a little more insight into what exactly neuropsychological testing is, which would be great. Okay, so very, very literal interpretation of the, of the title. I want to talk about what it is that we are doing when we're doing the testing at Madison Clinic uh, for neuropsychological or neurocognitive impairments uh, to inform uh, the diagnosis um, for typically for other providers to make. We're not usually the ones uh, doing the decision making. Um, so the plan uh, is to talk for a, a minute about the complexities of thinking or cognition, um, understand the domains of typical neuropsych testing, um, and then I'll, we'll talk about how that's applied to HIV-associated neurocognitive disorders. Some of you have probably uh, seen a slide similar to this. I apologize to the folks who are uh, on the phone. But it's sort of a, a classic example of how interesting our cognitive abilities are. Uh, for those of you who can't see it, um, it's, it's an example of, word, of a word scramble that basically asserts that uh, as long as you have the right first and last letter uh, of words uh, in a sentence uh, or in a word itself, uh, it doesn't matter what order the rest of the letters are, you can read them all the same. And it's just a, a tribute to how our human mind sort of interprets things and understands things contextually uh, by the, a lot of interrelated processes. So uh, the, the, it actually reads according to research at Cambridge University, uh, and so I say this is an urban myth, there's no researcher at Cambridge University who did this work, but the premise is true that, that there's a lot of complicated processing that goes on um, through multiple different things. And the, the point of this is that thinking or cognition is a complex, multifaceted phenomenon. When you think about the kinds of things that need to happen just to interpret a particular stimulus or a particular percept, like uh, a beautiful ladybug, um, there's color, there's depth, there's form, there's motion, there are different systems that are interpreting and processing each of these things and then combining that information into a single percept that we have some contextual understanding of, uh, unless you've never seen a ladybug before, in which case it's uh, just a strange creature that, uh, that you would need some additional uh, interpretation. I mean, not only that, for the, for the uh, you know, visual wonks out there, of course, this percept is coming in upside down backwards and through a layer of blood vessels before our brain erases all of that information as well. So it's a pretty amazing set of things that is going on in our brains. In terms of the sort of typical domains of cognition, and I have highlighted here or bolded here the ones that we are specifically assessing for in HIV-associated neurocognitive impairments, uh, we're talking about processing speed, attention and working memory, learning memory, visual spatial ability, I guess that should be bolded because I do actually test for that, but uh, language executive functioning, motor functioning, and emotional behavior. So let's talk about each of these specifically from the perspective of what am I doing when I am testing people for these abilities. So the ones that you can find readily online and that you can Google, I have put here in slides. The ones that are copyrighted, I did not put in the slides. So this is a standard test. This is called the trail making test part A. And the instructions are very simple. I would like you to draw a line from, or you know, you'd give them the, the, the general description. What you'll see on this page is circles with numbers inside of them. What I want you to do is draw a line from one to two, two to three, three to four, and so on until you reach the end without lifting your pencil. Okay, so it's sort of a, it's a visual scan, right? What is your capacity to see the correct uh, items on the piece of paper and then the, the sort of psychomotor ability to draw a line between them? It's really rare in the testing that I do at Madison Clinic that somebody is not good at this. Uh, and if they're not, it's, uh, I'm not sure how much more testing would be required at that point um, if they're not able to do the visual scan and or they're uh, unable to draw the line because there are some other things that you need to do with eye-hand coordination. Um, so that's a very straightforward test. It'll take you about 30 seconds, and that's about what it takes most of the folks that we do testing at Madison. Uh, in terms of attention and working memory, this is a very standard way of assessing that. Um, the instructions would be, I'd like you to take a look at these boxes. On the top, you'll see that there are numbers that go along with each mark, and below you'll see that there are numbers but no marks. Your job is to draw the correct mark that goes with each number. And give them the instructions starting in the top left corner, working left to right as quick as you can. When you finish one line, please start with the next. And the basic idea with working memory, this is our capacity to uh, access information that is being stored short term in our brains, in our minds, 
Um, and so there should actually be an acceleration of your ability to complete this task, right? You should be faster at the end than you were at the beginning, but you're not checking back and forth now as much because you've got some of this memorized, at least in terms of working memory. So it's taking you decreasing amounts of time to get the correct uh, mark for each number uh, that's going along. So what would it look like then to have impairments in processing speed or working memory? So one of the things that you can do to simulate uh, impairments in processing speed or working memory is to give yourself a cognitive load. Uh, so I'd like you all to remember this 10-digit number string. And I will shut up for a moment to let you do that. But only a moment, because <clears throat> it's hard. So try and keep that number as memorized as you can uh, without writing it down. <laughs> Try and keep that number in your mind. Uh, and then remember these instructions. I'd like you to go out of the building and take a left, go three blocks until you've seen the sign for North Ogren Street, turn left, and the address is 416 North Ogren. All right, so who can correctly tell me both the number and the instructions? But this is the idea that, of something that our patients may be facing, right, is if they have the cognitive load, if they have the, the impairment in processing speed or working memory, this is sort of the equivalent of having this cognitive load, right? It's, it's capacity that is depleted from our ability to keep track of these kinds of things. And so we're trying to figure out the extent to which this is impaired. Uh, and it's, it's, again, like you trying to remember the number and the instructions. Um, let's see how many. You can, you can grade, your, grade yourself on the test. Um, of course, I made it easy on myself in case anybody ever asked me. That's an old that's phone number place. from childhood. Uh, your name place. of a friend, uh, all that kind of stuff. So, but again, just to give you a sense of what it's like, you know, and you probably can think of, of analogs in your own life where you're just really distracted by something and it is difficult for you to pay attention to what you're doing. It's the same kind of thing, except now we're talking about uh, in HIV-associated neurocognitive disorder, we're talking about uh, an impairment in capacity that doesn't uh, wax and wane as much as, as we would like it to, um, or as much as it might in a normal day. Like We might be stressed, and that could impair our cognition or our working memory, uh, whereas with the uh, impairments in capacity, it's a, it's a more sustained problem. Uh, in terms of assessing memory, you know, again, pretty straightforward stuff. I'm going to read you a list of words. I'd like you to listen carefully, and when I finish, I'd like you to repeat back as many as you can. Uh, you can tell the words back to me in any order. You don't have to say them in the same order that I do. And so I just read a list of 10, ten words that are more or less semantically unrelated. So they can't use any clever mnemonics to, well, they can still use clever mnemonics, I suppose. But um, that's one way of assessing memory. Um, and the trick is I'm doing this list. I repeat it four times, and then I'm going to actually ask them again about this list later. I don't tell them that, but we're going to see what their delayed capacity is for retaining this information. Then another way to do it, because a, a list of unrelated, uh, semantically unrelated words may not be a great test for the ability of one of our patients to understand, you know, sort of what's going on with their lives or in order to, like, uh, more of a narrative, I guess, understanding of what's going on. And so we can also do, I'm going to read you a short story, same instructions. I'd like you to listen carefully when I finish. Please repeat back as much as you can. Uh, and I read, we go through that twice. Like I said, we, we do that. And then at the end of the test, I go back through and ask them if they can remember these things. Do you remember that list of words that I read to you in the beginning? You can imagine that a lot of times the answer is no. And so we can also do some, re some recognition. So I read them words. Some of, the some of them were on the list and some of them weren't. So we can see, is there any at least recognition of the, ma of the material that was, was given? Uh, and the immediate and delayed recall, is, they're correlated, obviously, but not perfectly. And it's, it's always interesting to me when people do relatively well on the delayed memory task, even though they struggled on the immediate recall. So they'll, they'll get as many words, for example, you know, 15 minutes later that they did uh, right away. So there have even been times, uh, in fact, I uh, just had somebody who recalled words on the delayed task that he hadn't recalled on the initial task. So it's always interesting. That's not typical, but it does happen. Uh, in terms of language, and this is important, I think, um, for uh, HIV-associated uh, impairments, because a lot of times you'll see very intact language functioning. So you can have a great conversation with somebody who is in your clinic, and it seems like they understood, you know, they were able to repeat back, all this kind of stuff, and then they walk out the door and they come back later and they're like, no, no, we didn't talk about that, or I don't recall, right? So it's not necessarily even a problem with memory, although that may be it. I'm sorry, it is a problem with memory, but their language is, is, is sufficiently intact that they can have a good, intelligent conversation with you. And one of the things that we noticed eight years ago when we started doing this testing is that, you know, there was a lot of doubt on the part of referring providers. You know, do we really, does this person really need a referral? 
And almost everybody, when we first started doing this, was coming in pretty significantly impaired on the domains that you would expect with HIV dementia. But it was a surprise only because their language function was so intact. So they were just they were having great conversations with providers and then remembering nothing about them when they were, you know, had 10 minutes out the room. So for language, you do uh, tell me all the words that you can think of that start with the letter F, start with the letter A, start with the letter F, uh, S. I'm sorry. Uh, tell me the names of all the different kinds of fruits and vegetables that you can think of. Tell me the names of all the different kinds of zoos that you would find in an animal that you can, zoo that you can find in an animal. Animals that you could find in a zoo. Uh, and then there's a task where it's just literally picture naming, uh, show them pictures. Because obviously if, if somebody's experiencing an acute aphasia, they're going to have difficulty just naming common objects. Again, that's something that does not, does not come up very often in, in our testing, the, that kind of aphasia. Uh, executive functioning, this is actually something that we weren't doing when we started doing this testing at Madison Clinic, but was added in after consultation with some uh, smart people who do this. Um, and it's necessary uh, for the diagnosis, actually, of, of HIV, at least the research criteria for HIV um, neurocognitive disorder. So uh, executive functioning, if you don't know what it is, it's sort of listed up there. But, you know, obviously anything that's um, planning or decision making sort of response override, I think those are two important things, right? The ability of somebody to make deliberate plans and take action on them and also not to do things that they are not supposed to be doing. So this comes up a lot when, when housing, when, when there's strange behavior going on in housing and people are putting themselves at risk for losing their housing. This is a famous one called the Stroop task. Uh, I'd like you to read the font color instead of the word. Um, and you go through this kind of a test and, and you'll, you'll notice if you do it yourself, it's a little harder to say going left to right, blue, green, red, orange, than it is to say red, blue, green, yellow, right? We're just disposed to read the word and not the font color. And so you can measure somebody's executive ability based on, on, on their capacity to do that and their speed in doing it. So if you say, I'd like you to read the font color and they say red, blue, green, yellow, you'd say, okay, I'd like you to read the font color rather than the word itself. And if they say red, blue, green, yellow, right, there's some difficulty in them intending to do something that's contrary to what their brain is telling them, which is to read the word and not the color. This is the other one. This is the trail making part B. So it's the similar instructions to trails A. Only this time what you'll see is that there are both numbers and letters. I want you to alternate between numbers and letters. So you'll draw your line from 1 to A, A to 2, 2 to B, B to 3, and so on until you reach the end. And we do actually see a fair number of people who are referred uh, who really struggle with this. Although you can take, you know, a minute, almost a minute and a half and still be within normal limits. Um, but there are times when people just quit. They just, I can't, this, this is terrible, I can't do this. So I put in the definition in case it was uh, unfamiliar to anybody, but we want to, you know, we'll see impairment in at least two cognitive domains uh, of, the, of that list that we just went through. Um, interference with daily functioning for at least a month and no competing explanations. And that's the tricky one, and that's uh, a lot of times why I and, and the psychology residents are not uh, attempting to make the formal diagnosis um, because, you know, we get 45 minutes or an hour. We're relying on histories taken by other providers, and so we'll refer the results back and say, you know, let's make sure it's not drugs. Let's make sure there's no other competing explanations for, for what might be going on. Uh, in terms of what to do, you know, the, the, there's not much. There are not a lot of trials, and I, I, get, I realize I should be careful uh, saying this, of course, the what is working with the treatment of HIV dementia is treating the HIV infection. Uh, but in terms of psychosocial rehabilitation after we have stabilized, uh, there's not a lot going on yet uh, in terms of treatment trials. But standard stuff that you would think of, uh, verbal, written, and visual reminders, checking for understanding and simplification. So I'll stop there. <laughs>